A lot of actors have become synonymous with Hollywood over the years, but few are quite as infamous as the one and only Marlon Brando. The late actor captivated movie-going audiences from the 50s all the way up to his death in 2004, ensuring he'll always be remembered as one of the all-time greats. But Brando didn't just work in Hollywood, he lived there for most of his professional life as well. One of the finest homes he ever owned on the California coast was a Hollywood Hills property he lived in back in the 90s. 1950s, a house he was so proud of, he became one of the first actors to ever provide the public with a tour via satellite link on the CBS talk show Person to Person in 1955. Known as the Laurel View Residence, this property is tucked right into the heart of Los Angeles, situated above Nicholas Canyon and boasting two 70 degree jetliner views of the City of Angels. But this four bed, five bath home is notable for more than just its views of esteemed properties nearby, like Frank Lloyd Wright's Stora residence. It's also an architectural treat. Designed in 1926 by renowned architect A.F. Liszt, the home offers a relaxed quality with a Spanish colonial styling. Outside, the mansion boasts unique circular tower structures and red tile roof. Meanwhile, the inside of the 4,300 square foot home features vaulted ceilings expansive tiled floors, and sweeping staircases that give a theatrical vibe. Out front, a winding stone path leads directly to a heavy antique front door that opens onto a tiled front foyer with set of stairs that steps down to the informal living area featuring a dramatic fireplace. As you can probably tell from this space, the property was built for entertaining. And with Brando as its owner, you just know it's seen its fair share of Hollywood soirees. There is even a second living room located on the very bottom floor of the home with carpet floors, built-in shelving, white walls, and large gated doors that lead directly to the outside. Brando used to use this space as his own personal bongo studio. Away from the gathering spaces, the home's remodeled kitchen offers sleek white cupboards and subway tile backsplash, as well as polished wooden worktops stretching from one wall to the other. As for the nearby sunlit dining room, it's simply begging to be put to use and has enough room for close to a dozen guests. Rounding out the ground floor offerings is a stunning library with a ton of built-in shelves. Moving upstairs, the bedrooms are perfectly sized and drowning in luxury, striking just the right balance between coziness, warmth, glam, and minimalism. What's less minimal is the master suite, which features amazing views alongside a sunroom annex that you just know the former Don Corleone put to good use. There's also a detached two-car garage on the property. But the one thing this home is missing is a swimming pool. If you're gonna buy this place, it's probably not to get a few laps in. It's to become part of Hollywood history and stand in the very room where Marlon once famously took a photo in 1955 while holding his first Oscar. So if you've got a little over $4 million to spare, why not consider this offer that seems too good to refuse? That last home might have been Marlon Brando's nicest in LA, but it was far from his only one. During the 1950s and 60s, he spent the majority of his time living in a home opposite of Universal Studios. Built in 1939 and designed by pioneering African-American architect Paul Revere Williams, this home in the San Fernando Valley is where Brando was living while shooting The Wild Ones and On the Waterfront. Set on a triangular lot that's nearly an acre large, this gated estate includes a 5,000 square foot main house with 16 rooms, including six beds and five baths. Spread out across two levels, a couple of those bedrooms are large guest suites and there's also a family room to enjoy with a brick fireplace as well as a wall of windows that lead out to a sundown. The kitchen decked out in cherry wood cupboards and built-in stainless steel appliances partnered with some hardwood floors. Just a couple steps away from there is the home's dining room with its low-hanging chandelier and picture frame windows. The home also includes a relatively small home office with a fireplace, as well as a comfy den with tile floors and French doors that lead directly to the backyard. The amenities out back include a pool, barbecue, sports courts, and an expansive deck. Pretty nice spot, right? Well, as nice as it is, it isn't where Marlon would spend his final days. For that, we have to travel to another of his former homes located on Mulholland Drive, a 12-bedroom residence that was originally built in 1954 with three bedrooms and four baths in slightly more than 3,000 square feet of space. 
While living here, Marlon was next door neighbors with Jack Nicholson and the street quickly earned the nickname of Bad Boy Drive. Nicholson and Brando would remain neighbors for over 30 years until Brando died at the age of 80. In a tribute for Rolling Stone magazine, Nicholson remembered Brando as not only his neighbor, but one of his closest friends, writing, Hell, he's Brando, but we shared more than a driveway. As a neighbor, he was perfect, a great guy who was always there for you. He likes his space and so do I, but as he put it many times, we'd always be watching each other's back. After Brando passed, Nicholson lived up to this promise by spending $5 million to buy Marlon's former home. According to reports, Nicholson did so with the intention of passing it on to Brando's children. Despite having at least 11 kids, none of them wanted to hold on to the place. Once Nicholson discovered his friend's home was overrun with mold, he demolished the place instead and turned it into a garden of frangipani flowers in 2006. But there was one other residence that Brando would frequent towards the end of his life. His home in French Polynesia, which is exactly where we're going next. While filming Mutiny on the Bounty in the early 1960s, Marlon Brando fell in love with two things. His female co-star, Tarita Teripaya, and the island of her birth, Tahiti. French Polynesia is renowned for its stunning beauty, and after this pair was married, they purchased a small island just off the coast of Tahiti known as Titiaroya. There, they built a small house and a hotel while having two children. As time passed, Marlon and his wife would separate and the property they shared fell into obscurity. While occasionally holding himself up on the island as a recluse in his later years, Brando would envision turning this spot into an eco-resort, a self-sustaining luxury environment for guests. He wouldn't get the chance to bring this idea to life, but his children would. In July of 2014, Brando's descendants renovated the entire property and transformed it into one of the world's most stunning luxury beach hotels, known simply as the Brando. This resort uses sustainable energy systems such as salt water air conditioning, solar energy, organic gardens, and so much more to leave as small an environmental impact as possible. What's more, there's also a research facility on site with special accommodations for resident scientists. When it comes to your everyday guests, there are 31 bedroom villas to choose from, all of which are very spacious, with over a thousand square feet of space. Each of these villas looks out onto the ocean and has its own private pool with a secluded beach area. With the Brando being all-inclusive, meals and drinks, including most alcohol, is already taken care of, and there's even 24-hour dining services available with delivery directly to your villa. Each guest receives a bicycle upon arrival to explore the island and a daily 50-minute massage. Each guest receives a bicycle upon arrival to explore the island and a daily 50-minute massage. There are also several water activities to participate in, such as swimming to Mermaid Bay, snorkeling over reefs, stand-up paddle boarding, and scuba diving. But if you prefer to stay on land, you can go for a hike, bird watch, or search for turtles. If a little R&R is more of what you're after, then head over to the spa, which is located in the heart of the jungle. Considering the natural beauty of the spa, I'm kind of surprised Mar Marlon Brando ever decided to leave, and I wonder what he'd think of the place if he could see it now. One thing's for sure, whether it was in California or the Pacific, the man knew how to pick a beautiful home. Alright, that's gonna bring this latest house tour to a close. Thanks so much for watching, and before you head out, consider answering the following question. If you could be next door neighbors with one world famous actor, who would it be? Let me know who you'd want to form a friendship with as strong as Jack and Marlon had in the comments down below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications. My name's Kara the Vampire Slayer, and I'll see you all all in another video. Bye! Long considered to be the very personification of glamour, Audrey Hepburn's remarkable acting career would earn her the reputation as one of the industry's most popular performers of all time. Whether it was Roman Holiday or Breakfast at Tiffany's, once Audrey took to the screen, it was practically impossible to take your eyes off of her. As such, it only makes sense that during the height of her career, Audrey lived in a Los Angeles estate fit for a princess. In fact, her house was so incredible it would later become a home to a number of other Hollywood elites, including Mia Farrow, David Niven, and the actress who the property was later named after, Eva Gabor. 
located in the Los Angeles, California neighborhood of Holmby Hills. The Eva Gabor estate was originally designed and constructed in 1938 by the man referred to as the architect of the stars, Paul Williams. When the unit was complete, it boasted six bedrooms, five and a half bathrooms, a private tennis court, and a detached guest house on a little over one acre of land. Audrey lived here alongside her husband, Mel Fair, and she eventually departed from Hollywood shortly after this marriage ended in 1968. For the most part, however, the design of the house remains the same today, even if the decor has obviously changed in the intervening years. Located behind two large and dramatic gates, the house features a brick motor core out front. Stepping through the threshold of the front door will take you into the home's entryway with a curving staircase, symmetrical floor to ceiling mirrors, and a grand crystal chandelier, all of which serve as a great signifier of the home's grandeur. Speaking of grand spaces, the home's living room is large, cozy, and comes complete with a fireplace as well as a wall of built-in bookshelves. The nearby family room is equally as comforting, thanks in large part to its windows, which offer a ton of natural light with views of the property's gardens. I can't help but imagine Audrey acting out a real life scene from her bookshop in one of my favorite films, Funny Face. But reading wasn't the only thing Audrey would get up to here. She was also a great cook, which is probably why this home has not one, not two, but three separate dining areas. First, there's a casual eating area that overlooks the home's backyard. Then, there's the black and white checkered floors in the dining room that offer a retro feel. And finally, there's the gourmet kitchen itself, where Audrey used to cook colorful, healthy meals. You can find out a lot more about those meals in her son's book, Audrey at Home. This home also boasted a series of massive bedrooms, including the home's deluxe master suite. But no Hollywood home is complete without an exciting backyard. Audrey's featured a tennis court, lush lawns, a well-maintained garden, and a very large swimming pool. As perfect as this spot was to unwind, after retiring from the movies in 1968, Audrey would sell this home and move to the one place where she was happier than anywhere else, Switzerland. Not everyone knows this, but Audrey Hepburn spent her final three decades on this planet as a Swiss resident. After her time as an entertainer came to an end, she retreated from the public eye and spent the rest of her life as a resident of Tolokinas, a village located only a few miles from the municipality of Morgus. Audrey's home was known throughout the village as La Paisible, which is French for peaceful and tranquil. As the name implies, Audrey finally found her little piece of heaven with this estate. The main structure is a large, modernized farmhouse, which dates back to the 1700s. It also featured all of the trappings of a movie star home, including an elegant salon with charming furniture, a grand piano, as well as loads of framed photos of Audrey and her many famous friends. According to reports from the Arunisu family, who lived on this estate alongside Hepburn as the property's gardener and caretakers with their young children, Audrey often hosted her many famous friends here, including Roger Moore, Robert Wagner, and the pianist Michael Tilson Thomas. But Audrey's favorite thing to do was tend to the property's garden where she worked tirelessly alongside her gardener Giovanni, helping him tend to the home's roses. Giovanni's wife, Ruchita, remembers how much these flowers meant to Audrey, telling Medium, She would pick lots of flowers and fill the house with bouquets. I made it a point to bring in bouquets and arrange them around the house when I knew she was coming back from a trip because I knew how much she loved flowers. Surrounded by roses, La Paisible was always there when Hepburn was most at ease, unwinding after long trips to some of the poorest and most disenfranchised parts of the world as an ambassador to UNICEF. Here, Audrey was able to relax, take in the pure air of the beautiful Swiss countryside and enjoy simple pleasures in life like fresh food as well as a gang of lively Jack Russell Terriers she doted upon and let run all over the house. Audrey's favorite dish of all was one that couldn't have been any simpler to make, pasta with tomato sauce and lots of fresh basil. She would personally fetch this from her garden. In other words, life at La Paisible was unhurried and relaxing. Audrey even taught the Runes' young daughter how to swim in the property's pool while their other children would lie on her bed watching videos on her TV set. 
Eventually, this fairy tale life came to an end when Audrey passed away on January 20th, 1993. Several years after her death, this estate was sold. The family living here returned to their native Sardinia and took Audrey's favorite dog, Penny, with them, caring for her until her death at the age of 19. Hepburn was buried not far from this home in a humble and well-kept grave in the area's small local cemetery among the village's far less famous residents. Kind of surreal to come across a celebrity's name on such an unassuming stone cross, but according to records, plans to exploit Hepburn's fame and attract visitors to the area failed. A local museum they created in her name is permanently closed, but some of her biggest fans can still follow a map that guides tourists across her former home, favorite cafes, and the town hall where she got married to Italian psychiatrist Andrea Dotti in 1969. Considering she married an Italian man, it makes a lot of sense that as much as Audrey adored Switzerland, there was one other place in Europe near to her heart, the city of Rome. The top floor of a 1930s palazzino in Rome's Parioli district was originally designated to be enjoyed as a spot to leisure, not a residence. But once Audrey Hepburn set her sights on the unit spaces, drenched in daylight, with wide windows framing the city's vista, she turned it into a penthouse suite. Today, this 5,700 square foot dwelling is owned by a contemporary couple who have brought in Milan designer Christina Celestino to author a tranquil retreat that feels at home in its urban environment. For starters, the living area not only opens to the terrace, it also faces west to ensure for some sunset views. And the property's bedrooms, they've been sequestered to the home's south wing, which leaves the kitchen and dining areas facing north. Throughout the entire home, tonal floors of classic Italian travertine, as well as bleached oak tiles have been arranged in a woven pattern. Then there's the muted mint of the entrance hall, which helps bring an instant sense of calm, an aesthetic that's been carried over to the living and dining areas of the home too. Elsewhere around the property, you'll find a number of boxy alcoves that capture the views and create perfect spots for modern furniture, like the white section on the living room, the bronze leather in the lounge, or the guest suite's upholstered bed. Primary suite's dressing room and bathroom features a pink palette, which fosters a sense of femininity that Audrey would have loved. All of this to say that now more than ever, Audrey Hepburn's former Palazzino is a sight to behold. It's also the perfect spot to daydream while enjoying the perfect Roman holiday. There you have it, the most important homes in the life of the late and great Audrey Hepburn. Which one resonates with you the most? Personally, the more I learned about her home in Switzerland, the more I imagined myself living there. But I'd love to hear what you all think. So before leaving, be sure to take a second to answer the following question. Would you rather live a quiet life in the idyllic Swiss countryside or the high life in a penthouse suite in the middle of Rome? Let me know which of Audrey's former lifestyles inspires you the most in the comments below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to make sure you don't miss an episode. My name's Kara the Vampire Slayer. Follow me on Instagram if you want to chat, and I'll see you all in another video. Bye!